to, before I start, stumbling over my words here, I've got an apology from the management, the, the great management of this event, um, just uh, for the regenerative agriculture. And I won't repeat that because uh, of the pronunciation, but they do apologize and hope that it didn't spoil your event. So on to uh, my session uh, today. Uh, I noticed that it, I don't have a profile in, in the in the profile space. I'll, I'll say very quickly that um, I have a background in, in agriculture, crop and forestry risk assessment going back <laughs> years and um, have been looking at uh, forestry specifically since about 1995. So uh, I collected data and, and it sort of went on from there. Um, <clears throat> so that's my background. And in addition to that, being involved in various EU, um, ESA, that's a European Space Agency and EU Horizon 2020 project. So there's a bit of sort of research and development going on at the side and this under, underlines or, or supports the underwriting that we do. So welcome to this session, Forestry Investment Profiling for Climate Risk. And <clears throat> I'll just... Uh, <laughs> okay, right, we're, we're getting there. Um, <clears throat> so yes, a little bit about us as opposed to me. Uh, Globe is now part of the Aldona Group, um, just been completed that purchase. And as you see, that's the largest independent insurance broker in the UK. 8,000 employees and uh, they have their own sustainability charter for all group activities. So that's a bit of a good sign. Uh, Globe itself, operating under the brand name Forestry, uh, is an independent insurance agency. Uh, we're a Lloyds cover holder, which simply means that we can issue policies uh, with a rating uh, throughout the world. Uh, and in addition to that, we get support for the larger accounts from reinsurance company worldwide, often the, the, the good and the great in, in Switzerland and so on. And as you see at the bottom, we insure in 30 countries, There's a little map there that shows <clears throat> where we're doing business in, in the blue areas and inquiries from the green areas. Obviously, green areas become blue over time. Um, Africa is of particular interest uh, to us because of uh, things in, in the past. We, we have new contacts there, so I'm hoping we're to uh, do more in, in Africa, Asia is particularly, um, particularly uh, good and expensive area for us as well. Um, so that's our, our spread. And these are the themes. Um, it's great after all these years that forestry carbons come to the fore, been waiting 20 years for that. Um, and of course, it's thrown the spotlight on forestry itself. So I thought the best thing I could do would, would be to have a quick overview of, of climate change and forests. Uh, nobody else has done that yet. So we'll fly through a few dramatic slides, and then how forests are responding to increasing temperatures. Uh, of course, a lot of our forestry is actually plantations, and a lot of the discussions today have been about natural forestry, uh, and we're, we're fully supportive of that. But the plantations are, if you like, the, <clears throat> what is it, the budget guard in the cage, uh, showing us, in fact, what, what can happen. So we'll be sharing some of that uh, knowledge as we go through. Um, and then the rest of it is really saying, well, why wouldn't you want to know your project risks, your fire, your wind, and so on, as these are probably the biggest risks you're going to face over the next 20, 30, 40 years. Uh, and we talk a bit of our, our, our models and, and why we think they are um, useful for everybody. <clears throat> so globally, this is a, a new chart. I haven't seen this for a bit. 22,000 years of, of temperature. So that is rather scary. And you can see that classic hockey stick temperature rise in the in the red circle so it's it is very dramatic and rather scary of course out of that becomes a lot of uh, wildfires and there's a map from last week don't uh, point the finger at all these countries with forest fires remember it is a seasonal thing and at different times of years uh, different countries will be on fire but it is a dramatic um, image as you all know and we were told a hundred times last week Temperatures are rising, we're currently 1.2 degrees above average, um, and we're witnessing unprecedented weather extremes all over the, the world, whether it's the Arctic uh, or, or, or Latin America or, or wherever. And the sciences were heading for a plus three, plus five degrees centigrade without intervention. And even COP26, you'll all know very well from last week, uh, 2.4 to 2.7 under current measures. So there's a huge 
way to go on that. And with greater temperatures, we get greater volatility. And it's the volatility is, is I suppose, today's word. Um, and we'll come back to it again and again. So even though it's 1.2 above average, Oregon last year was plus six degrees higher than average. And uh, as you see there, July was the world's hottest month ever recorded. Similarly, we're getting more wildfires. Very good data from the states there, and you can see the wildfires gradually increasing. A little learning, learning point here is the, of course, the, the area burnt is not related to the number of wildfires, and that would apply to anybody, by the way, with a project. The number of ignitions tends to be pretty constant, unless there's a change in the environment, such as a new settlement or, or something like that. It's all about conditions at the time of the ignition uh, rather than the ignitions themselves. Uh, of course, with more fires, we're getting more uh, carbon emissions and a, a little chart from California. Uh, and I ring the 2008 because we were, we've been in the States trying to develop this business since um, 2000. And at that time, 2006, seven, eight, the fires were beginning to hit the headlines. Well, they've certainly hit the headlines now, as you see from the, the carbon emitted in 2021. And the, the numbers are, are staggering, of course, but it does, uh, it, it does point out, if you like, the benefit from uh, managing forestry really well, whether it's um, a new forest, uh, agroforestry, uh, or indeed preventing deforestation. Huge, uh, huge opportunities and huge problems. And similarly, far seasons are getting longer. And this map of New Zealand was 2008, but even then a third longer um, far seasons than previously. And after 50 or 60 years, they had their own little catastrophe, a mini catastrophe, I might call it, because it's a very low risk country with the Nelson fire, the like of which hadn't been seen for about 50 years and two and a half thousand hectares burnt. While in California, they might scoff at that, but not in New Zealand. Uh, and of course, more mega fires. And you've got two little examples there, not little, huge. Uh, 2007, the Black Saturday fire, which <clears throat> was the world's worst at the time, <clears throat> excuse me, and 2017, the, the tropical storm Ophelia, and that swept up through um, Portugal, starting fires as it went from landing fire brands. It was, it was a, a nightmare scenario for people living there. And then it passed up to Ireland and blew our trees down. So it was a quite a storm that affected the whole of, of, of the Western coast of Europe. And the, the, the scary thing about mega fires is A, they're increasing in size, so there are new categories of them, and Chile back in 2016, 17, developed a, a new category, a category six, I think it was, for, for a mega fire. And these events, these mega events, have no mathematical relationship to the previous biggest events. So this is a big unknown. This is something we can't model, but we should be aware of. Uh, we, I, I slipped this in, actually, after an early session today, uh, because the comment was really pertinent. Uh, down at the bottom their clients tend to prefer to invest in fire prevention uh, and minimizing risk rather than obtaining covers and we would say great fantastic as an insurer that's what you should be doing uh, and, the, and the reason why is the column on the left down at the bottom the, the figure 10 it just says the current limit to suppression direct attack of aircraft machines water and, and chemicals is right down there beyond that there is no potential to fight these fires. They're giving out uh, huge, huge, unbelievable amounts of energy. Uh, and that is why you might ensure it is for the catastrophic, it's for the mega fire, it's for the one in a hundred year event. Uh, so yeah, invest in fire prevention. We would ask you to do that anyway, but also don't think that's gonna cover your risk. And we probably have an example coming up soon. Um, as you can tell, yeah, it is coming up soon. I just see there. So increased volatility affects hurricanes, uh, droughts, extreme rainfall because there's more moisture in the air, and and floods. Um, this uh, that that picture, by the way, is, is from Poland uh, that had huge uh, storms. I think back in 2012 or something. But the comment at the bottom, highlighted in yellow, is is just striking. I think it hits the nail on the head. You know, the average or normal is a kind of moving target. It doesn't mean anything anymore, except sort of roughly where you are. And, and we'll talk more about this later. 
So here we are. This was a slide I was expecting a moment ago. So what is the average? Um, this is a long time series of um, Australian plantation managed extremely well by a company that actually did decide that they could manage fires in 2008 uh, and they, they stopped insuring. But in 2009, they had a 10% loss. I believe that was in the order of 60 million Australian dollars. Now, it's that sort of thing we're talking about. It's the mega event, it's the extreme event that you cannot predict. Um, volatility would have suggested that fire might have been uh, five or six times greater than the mean, but actually it was 40, 50 times bigger than the mean or the average. So you can see the trend there, apart from the big red columns, you can see that up to 2000, very small average loss and a model 1 to 50 year event of 3.4% of the area. If you're looking at the last 20 years, it is whatever, it is six times greater with a 15% modeled uh, worst case scenario. And 15% incidentally, 15 to 25% was the uh, amount of forest that was lost uh, in 2019-20. So modeling, modeling sort of works, doesn't it? It does give you an indication of what might happen. Uh, and the average is pretty meaningless. A similarly, a hundred year record of Australian um, losses. And those final two columns show you that 130,000 hectares of managed forest was burnt uh, in Australia in 2019-20. Actually, the total was something like 8.3 million hectares, which is great in the area of the UK. And losses uh, were approaching $1 billion. We are assured by insurers locally. Uh, and this is why the insurance sector perhaps is, is, is rather standing back from forestry. And it's why I'm talking about risk measurement and modeling. So beware the average, it's only an indicator. Uh, if you can work out the volatility, which is easy enough, standard deviation over the average, uh, it, it, it will indicate roughly what the, the cat event would be. So the volatility, low volatility will be 50%, high volatility, three or 400% of the standard deviation over the mean. And that means your, your fires at these higher volatilities could be 20, 30, or 40 times bigger than the average. So that's a back of the envelope indication of what your risk is out there. Uh, again, I am talking about plantations, but something similar would happen in other environments. Uh, and it indicates really that if your data is poor, then you might make poor decisions when it comes to site selection. Uh, and to help us cope with this data, um, the basis risk, if you like, we've turned to using burn scar measurements, which we'll talk about a little later on. Uh, we can measure these since 2009 for anywhere in the world. We, we do it, uh, well, you'll see the details, down to about 25 hectares. Um, and we can measure that by land cover type and different types of, of tree or agriculture or, or whatever. So that's a huge uh, a bonus to us. Uh, wind is a particular problem as data is uh, almost unavailable and we'll talk about that later. So the rate of loss is rapidly increasing. Uh, mapping fire risk. Uh, we use a tool called Earthblocks, which I endlessly talk about because it's just great for the, for the small team that doesn't have coders and people who are familiar with Copernicus and all the um, uh, plethora of um, EU-based data. Uh, and we are able to use this to, to do this analysis. As we said, we, we look at crops, we look at uh, all types of trees. Uh, and to do this, we work on the boundary of the client of the person that might be wanting insurance. And that's an essential part of the, of the process. And we're able to compare the, the general environmental loss uh, with the loss within the boundaries of the person asking for insurance. So, that is what that little chart shows you. That's from South Africa. And you can see the bright red client boundaries and around that a 10 or 20 kilometer range that we also measure. So we can see how they compare with the, with the background. Uh, a lot on this slide, but essentially what we have is the ground cover within the site, within the, with the insured uh, boundaries. And you can see that mostly trees are, are suitably green. And you can see on the left the burn scars, and we can compare that with the whole area in which they they um, 
they exist, uh, and those are the two the two squares to bottom, uh, below them, showing the, the land cover and the burn scars. And, and in this particular case, 52% of the area was, um, was forested and, and the rest was agriculture, water and, and other things. And that task for that client, about three hours, it just depends uh, how much resolution, whether you're looking at yearly burn scars or, or, or monthly burn scars. We get a table like this, we don't have to go into it, but you have there all the forestry classes, uh, closed, evergreen and so on, all the way through to open forest unknown, which is probably wildland fire. And as you see, we're measuring it for each year on the left hand side there. And at the bottom, we do a single 10 year burn scar mapping. So that just looks at areas with a burn scar on it. And the interesting thing is there, we're getting multiple burns. We're getting, um, so something like three times the actual burn scar area is recorded on a year by year basis, which tells us that sites are burning many, many times over and they uh, will not be managed plantation. There'll be everything around it. Uh, and they give you two different mean loss rates. And our loss rates, by the way, are the area burnt over the area exposed to fire. So that's a bit of an eyeful that chart, but apologies, and, and moving on. Uh, so we've applied this to start mapping the, the entire globe for a forest loss. Having said that averages were very um, meaningless, or well, not meaningless, an indication, it is actually a useful indication. So here we go with a couple of, um, with four states in uh, Brazil, Amazonas, and you can see if that's no fires at all in the, in the thick um, the jungle there, but we are getting fires on the periphery where there's deforestation and, and so on much as you would expect, 0.21% of the area burnt annually is uh, a reasonably low. Uh, Marano um, is, you see, a lot higher, probably twice the risk, a lot of multiple burns, and so on. So of those four areas that we look at, uh, Rio Grande do Sol is clearly the lowest fire risk. It's visually obvious, and it's obvious from the data, and uh, far fewer multiple burns. But as I said, we've uh, done that for many countries around the world. Our biggest problem is, is wind data. Uh, we asked, we're asked for wind cover, whether it's Australia or the USA or, or Asia, and wind records are notoriously poor. Um, so we're looking at a wind, what we might call a wind scar product for next year, 2022, uh, which again will work wherever we are in the world. Unlike the fire, which was to 25 hectare resolution, this will be better than a tenth of a hectare. It'll actually be a hundredth of a hectare in the, in, in the biggest, um, most, uh, with the highest resolution areas. Those are necessary because wind damage is, is uh, uh, spotty. Um, you can get large areas, but often you get this pepper, pepper pot effect. And certainly in Ireland, they know all about it. So you get hundreds of, of half hectare damage plots. And we just had a sort of briefing this week on how far the team had got. This is a team at Edinburgh University. You can see the satellite view of somewhere in, in Texas or Louisiana. And on the right, the um, wind damage as recorded by the sensors at the moment. This still is in the calibration stage, but we are comparing it with data we have for that area so we can drown, ground truth it. Or as somebody said today, you know, the software can learn from the actual data that we can feed in. So we think this is going to be an immensely powerful tool. And certainly for uh, any investment where you want a 40 or 100 year sort of permanent target, you really need to know how much of it is going to blow over and what's going to happen to it. Uh, just another another image there for you to see. It's clear that the, the road going left to right there is being picked up as damage. So there's a bit of ref refinement to to happen there. But this is um, early stages, so we're pretty we're pretty excited about how it might look in in another few months. So in summary, the quality of forestry investments are paramount for sustainability. And uh, as has been discussed in some of the previous sessions, you know carbon offsets, some of them you'll want 40 to 100 year permanence or potential for permanence. And this is quite a challenge and natural forests are clearly the, the best for that, but not, not uh, without threats as, 
as uh, investments in California will, will tell you about. Um, the recent price losses have shocked the industry um, and have driven us to try and improve our risk analysis. And it's in, absolutely crucial that uh, not only you as managers, but as investors, um, you're able to report on the fire and or wind risk that you're likely to enter into by making uh, an investment decision. So that's a bit of a rush through the, um, the, te the, the technical background to what we're doing. And as an insurer, I should tell you a bit about the products. These two are changing. Here on the right, you get a, a, a simple picture of, of what we normally cover, and that's fire and wind and a lot of other things. But the fire and wind is the bulk of the losses that we, <clears throat> that we, um, that we pay for, if you like. And the burn scar uh, technology is uh, replacing our traditional indemnity products. And that's currently only on offer in USA, Latin America, and Australia. That is to say, um, there is no traditional product there anymore. And within probably 12 months, it will be worldwide as we uh, develop the, the expertise and the data and, and fine tune the rating. For the rest of the world, <clears throat> for the moment, traditional products might still be available. Uh, and as for wind, that will be traditionally uh, insured, as we have done in the past, using substitute data uh, that, that, shall we say, is, is good enough to give a, a reasonable price for the risk. And then in this year, we are, are pushing um, a drought product for, for young forests uh, or other, well, of course, it works for crops as well, which is the water balance index. <clears throat> and we'll talk about that in a, in a second. So the parametrics, uh, burn scar indemnity, pseudo parametric tool, which means it's actually based on measuring the losses due to um, the due to fire by satellite. Um, the drought is the um, is based on hourly temperatures and rainfall and wind speeds uh, and um, humidity. The wind we've spoken about, uh, and we're also working on. Uh, forest carbon offset insurance. N not an easy challenge, and we've been thinking about it for about 10 years, but now we need to get serious with the, with the um, increased interest in forest carbon. And we have a little blank there for some reason. There we go. <clears throat> yes, so the, the burn scar, very simple. Satellites measure the burnt area and compare that with the situation before the fire, and that gives you the area lost due to the fire. Resolution is about one hectare, a little less, and we can assign a percentage damage to that, and then that is applied to your schedule. So it's, it's very similar to an additional product, <coughs> excuse me, but, um, but with a more rigorous measuring uh, protocol, if you like. The drought water balance index combines all the factors that leads to the dryness in any particular area. So we're looking at temperature, wind speed, solar radiation, atmospheric pressure, and other variables. The beauty of this is that they can apply this to any part of the world. And you can, if you like, insert into that location any particular crop, because any crop has its own profile of, of water needs and requirements. And that large, that uh, is, <coughs> excuse me, sort of 40 years of, of annual data there, which shows you the dry years and the wetter years. So while it's a drought product, of course, you could see that it's also an excess water product if that's how you want to use it. And as a grower, you, you could protect yourself from the event that is of significance to you in terms of, of dryness. Is it the one in 10 year or the one in 50 year and, and so on. And each of those will have its own uh, price. So that's the water balance index. <clears throat> and uh, finally, um, you know, insurance is not supposed to be a substitute for forest management. As we said earlier, it is uh, complementary. It goes with it. So your management is expected to deal with all the day-to-day, week-to-week, year-to-year uh, risks that affect your product. But the insurance is there for the excess event, the mega event, the event that you can't really predict other than some indication of how big that major event might be. 
and uh, with that knowledge of knowing your risk, you can then select your site for your forests to uh, minimize wind and fire exposures. And of course, if you're into a carbon project, you probably want to avoid the Gulf Coast uh, as much as you can, as uh, hurricanes are, are reasonably frequent there. And new insurance products will need to be adopted if you're going down that route. It isn't enough just to invest in fire prevention. You'll need to have some high level indemnity. So thank you for that. It's been a bit of a uh, charge through the topic. <coughs> and I'm just seeing a few questions <laughs> and, and a message some time ago saying I, I need to click the present present button again. So I don't know if you see any of that. And I will stop um, presenting. Okay. I'm not sure if we have time for questions. So we've got time for a couple of questions, Phil. So uh, we've got a question from the audience. Um, yeah. Are premium rates manageable compared to yearly return rates? Uh, well, the short answer is yes. I mean, typically in the, in the States, um, the cost of insurance might be 1 20th of your annual returns. Uh, it, but, you know, it's how long is a piece of string. So if as a large investor, you have um, $500 million invested, then you can retain quite a lot of the, the risk yourself and the, the rate will, will drop significantly. If you're a small grower or a family or community uh, farm, then your retained risk might be very small and your rate might be 0.4% uh, of the value <clears throat> or, or more, but uh, that is still well below your annual return. So I would say, yes, they are manageable, but it just depends where you're going to be. So a very high risk site, you're going to be paying a lot unless you retain a lot of your, a lot of your, um, potential losses as a as an excess and i, I see I, the second question yeah oh, look. what sorry <laughs> no no i was, I was going to read it to you but no last question and then we can wrap up so that's perfect um so uh so do you see a correlation between non-management or poor management and forest fires or insect attacks yeah but it, it's very very clear and this this is why we compare the uh, the, the, shall we say the fire risk within the boundary of your investment, that KMZ, and outside. Uh, we had a recent example only last week where the neighbours of this grower in Brazil lost 10,500 hectares and the insured lost one hectare. Uh, they weren't sitting there on, you know, on, on their hands, they were actually helping communities to fight those fires. But the fact is their investment, very significant investment per hectare, uh, was protecting their, their forests. So there's a very clear correlation and we'd, we'd have lots of data on that. Just think of Australia, 8.3 million hectares burnt and only 130,000 of managed plantations. And it looks like we're out of time or possibly on time. So thank you very much. Sorry it's been a bit of a rush, but um, hope you found it useful. <laughs>